This is a presentation of Munsey History, a transmedia story by Amanda Brown and Lisa Hoover for ICOM 375. First, before we talk about our project, the history of Munsey, we must talk about what transmedia storytelling is. Transmedia storytelling is a lot like traditional storytelling, but it can exist on multiple platforms to tell the story compared to just telling on one medium. Transmedia storytelling can also get the audience more involved with the story where they can even participate and or be involved with the story. That is just a brief explanation about what transmedia is. Now I will explain how we came up with the idea for the story. We decided in the early planning stages that we wanted our story to have a Munsey focus and also be based around history since Munsey celebrated its 150th birthday in 2015. We also wanted the story to have a mystery feel at the same time. I will briefly explain the plot of our story and the meaning behind the story. This transmedia story is meant to give users a better understanding of some of Muncie's history. Muncie is getting ready to, ready to celebrate its 150th celebration, and one of the artifacts on display is stolen. It is Emma Wood's job to try to get the necklace back before the celebration begins. The necklace that was stolen is Frances Woodworth's. She is the wife of George Ball, who was one of the Ball brothers. With the help of Sarah, who is also on the committee, committee, and the diary of George Ball, she will try to find out who sold the necklace and try to get the necklace back before the celebration. We used the hero's journey as a guide to organize our story. From this point, we took our storyline and came up with user requirements. We started by coming up with some usability goals for the story. We came up with two main ones that we felt tied in well with our story. And those two goals are learnability and entertaining. The reason we wanted our story to be more learnable is because we wanted our audience to learn more about the history of Muncie while at the same time still being entertained. Then we came up with 10 usability statements that both help tell the story and tied into the different usability goals. And those 10 uh, requirement statements were a starting page, learning about the characters, a page dedicated to the learning about the missing artifact, the diary of George Ball, Muncie history, a navigation page, getting the necklace back, a photo album, a map page, and finally a winning screen that would let users know they have completed the story. The, these 10 requirements helped us figure out what kinds of media we would need and it kept us organized. After we created our user requirements, it was time to move into creating our paper prototypes. By taking our user requirements in our storyline, we started to map out how our story was going to be told using a storyboard. And you can see at, at the upper left-hand corner uh, an example of our storyboard. So it has 12 steps. It has an entryway at the beginning and has the different parts of the stories in each of the rectangle boxes, and then the final is the ending message. Then by using the storyboard, we came up with a set of sketches of what we wanted each of the pages to look like. Here are some of the examples of our paper prototypes. So you can see at the top, at, on the right, um, this is an example of our homepage for our website and then down here we have an example 
of our form page and what the diary page was to look like. That included a map and a description of Francis's necklace. And then after we completed our paper prototypes, we turned those paper prototypes into a working prototype. Lisa is going to explain more about our prototype and some of the results we found from our user testing, which I will talk about more in detail at the end of the video. Hi. Welcome to Emma's Twitter page. As you can see, she's got a couple of tweets here. One that she got to see the necklace, and then a couple days later, she says, hey guys, check this out. And if you click on that link, it takes you to this, which is an invitation. You are cordially invited to the story of Francis's necklace. And everyone that looked through this said they wanted this clickable. So I made it clickable. But before we click it, that's what everyone did, was just went to this site. They didn't go back to see if there was anything else written in Emma's blog. And if you go back, you'll see that there is. And she got to see the the necklace that evening while they were setting up for the gala. She said it was everything that she thought it'd be. So she took a couple of pictures of it. But she knows she'll get better soon. So if we go back up here to this and click on it, it takes you to the website of Munsey Celebration. And the first thing I notice is it says missing. So I want to see what they're talking about. Oh, so you know that it's some the, the necklace is missing. And you want to click there. And that's what everyone did. No one checked out any of these things. Or read any of this. They just click there, which takes you to the forums, and it scrolls down to the bottom of the page. And I, I don't think that there's a way that when we link it to this, that it will link it to the top of the page. Um, Charles talks about how George Ball's wife, Frances Woodworth, the necklace of George Ball's wife, Frances Woodworth, is missing. William says it's awful. The celebration's coming up. And they decide that they want to look for the missing necklace. And Emma, I believe that this might be very handy. But a lot of people miss this right here. They missed this, this. Because it didn't stand out to them. So... You click on that and you get to the diary of George Ball. And I did have a couple of people that would scroll down looking for George Ball's diary. But realizing that that's what this was. So we want to make it bigger so we can read it. But when it opens up, when you make it bigger... You miss the top part of it to find out why this necklace is important. Some of the people couldn't understand why the necklace was important. This is why. George gave Elizabeth this, uh, George gave Francis this necklace on the day that their daughter was born.
And then this is some of his favorite Muncie locations. You have Betty's cabin. This is where my daughter, Betty, spent some of her time writing letters about her, her travels. And Sarah Miller, who's Sarah Miller Muncie, who is on our committee, thinks that we should check this place out. She thinks that whoever stole the necklace could be here or close by to there. So let's go back to the diary and we can go to the carriage house. And it's just that, a carriage house. It's where the horses were kept when they were using them for transport, when they weren't using them for transportation. And we'll go to Oakhurst. Oakhurst is where George, and Francis, and Elizabeth lived. Now the cabin is situated at the very back, back part of the yard from the house. And this is his brother's house, which is next door. And then this is Betty's dollhouse. And Betty's dollhouse was right behind their house, right behind Oakhurst, the house. And it was built two years before his brother's house was built. So I imagine that she would be out there playing, watching the people build her uncle's house when she was a little girl. Like I said, this is situated right outside her back door so that her mom could keep an eye on her. Now, Sarah says that we should go check out Minatrista. So that is what we've done in our live event. So we pulled in at, Met at Minatrista and we parked there in the parking lot. And we walked down through the walking trails and you enter in through the gate. And then you find Betty's cabin. And look for the letter. And then you read the letter. So now we want to add Emma Wood of Muncie on Facebook. So here's Emma's Facebook page where she said that Sarah and her were able to get the necklace back. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. She almost didn't want to get it back. What should she do? No, Emma, you must not keep the necklace for yourself. It doesn't belong to you. Think about how disappointed George would be if he ever saw, if he knew you didn't give the necklace back. Find out if she did the right thing. And then you can click here. Thank you, Emma. We have the necklace back. Thank you, Emma and Sarah. You have truly saved the day. So here in our story, we did start out in the ordinary world. And we got called into an adventure. And we had to refuse the call. Then we met our mentor and we crossed the threshold. And then we had our friends and enemies test. Well, we did try to follow all of the hero's journey. We had the ordinary world and then the special world. And then we returned back to the ordinary world, but we returned back changed and different. So I hope you enjoyed our story. Please feel free to look around. I know that there are Twitter um, pages for everyone. 
that's on the committee. As you can see, it's not just Emma, but Sarah and William. And here Sarah says that she's a student, a coffee junkie, and she's scared of zombies and can be reached here. And if you send her an email, she will send you one back. And here's William, who ends up being the bad guy in the whole thing, stealing a necklace. He's just a guy. He's not saying he's a good guy, not saying he's a bad guy. He's just a guy who likes shiny things. But he's a Ball State ICOM student, and he loves creating. So, I hope you enjoyed our story. Thank you. Now, I will talk about the testing we did on our working prototype. We used three different tools to collect data for the history of Muncie. Those three tools were a heuristic evaluation, a cognitive walkthrough, and a usability test. They were used to test and evaluate the design of our prototype and find strengths and weaknesses within our design. We had questions from seven different inquiry areas. Those seven inquiry areas were ease of use, learnability, which was one of our usability goals from the user requirements, efficiency, memorability, effectiveness, satisfaction, which was another one of our usability goals from the user requirements, and the last inquiry group was navigation. We asked users three different types of questions, which were Likert, ranking, and open-ended questions based around the seven inquiry areas. And now I will talk about the demographics of the users who took our, um, it, our usability survey. We had 10 users take our usability survey. The average age of the user was 35 years old, with 19 being the youngest and 74 being the oldest. 70% of users surveyed were females. All 10 users were from the Muncie area. 90% of the users were computer literate. When asked whether or not they knew what transmedia was, only one user answered yes. Five other users answered maybe, indicating that they may have heard of it or only a small amount about the subject, and four users had no idea what transmedia was. Lisa mentioned earlier in the video some of the problems that users ran into in our story. And that is how this story started out as just an idea and turned into a working prototype that we were able to get feedback on from our testing and saw what worked in the design and what didn't work in the design. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and thanks for watching.